what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. On the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. But the Lord is righteous, he loves justice. The upright will see his face. Glory be to the Father, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and forever shall be, world without end. Amen. The first reading is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, beginning at verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning at verse 1. <clears throat> When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you, and you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God, and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes, and have compassion on you, and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors, and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants, so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. You will again obey the Lord and follow all his commands. Sorry, you will again obey the Lord and follow all his commands I am giving you today. Then the Lord your God will make you most prosperous in all the work of your hands and, the, and in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock and the crops of your land. The Lord will again delight in you and make you prosperous just as he delighted in your ancestors. If you obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and decrees that are written in this book of the law and turn to the Lord your God with all, with all your heart and with all your soul. This is the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our second reading is taken from the book of John. From the book of John, chapter 14. Verses 15 to 23. John 14, chapter 14, verses 15 to 23. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I live. You will also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will too, I too will love you, love them, sorry, and show myself to them. 
Then Judas, not Judas, Judas Iscariot said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To the vicar, my good brother and friend, uh, the Reverend Professor Kefa Njenga, who leads this wonderful and thriving congregation here on the outskirts of uh, the city of Kiambu, and to my colleagues, uh, uh, Canon Massey, the lay readers, and all the leaders uh, here at the church named after St. Paul's, I bring you warm greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. Receive a lot of greetings from uh, All Saints Cathedral, where I serve both from our wardens and from my wife, Dr. Selena, and our family. They sent me with lots of greetings to you all. Mepokea, I'd want to acknowledge uh, one of the members of this parish who works with me. Uh, she is my, uh, my personal assistant in the office, uh, organizes me, and when I look disorganized, then she takes all the blames but when I am a little organized, then I take all the glory. Uh, that is uh, Mrs. Faith Waithaka. Uh, Faith, please stand. Just stand. Uh, she is a very organized lady. She supports me in the office. Uh, if you want to come and drink chai here to your All Saints, which is better than the tea here, please book an appointment with Faith. Thanks, Faith. She's a former chair of the choir. Amen. Uh, my good brother and friend, uh, Professor Kefa, did invite me today to join you in this, uh, in this event of putting together our resources as we uh, put up a gate that reflects the quality that this sanctuary is. Isn't that a great thing? Eh? You know, when you come in, the gate and the entrance does not look at all like St. Paul's. And the parking, I tried to come and park here, huku nyuma kando kando. Kakuta iko mawe mingi na mashimo mingi. Na nikashindwa, oh, oh, kumbe, arambeni ya kutengeneza uh, parking hapa. So, Faith Akanihara Zaka seme, we, Rudy, huku kwa kabros, ndi upaka hapo mzuri. So, I am so glad that we are doing the parking and we are doing the gate and I've seen the architectural impressions looking very great. Prof, we are happy to work with you more and more again. I bring God's word from several readings, a uh, key of them is Psalm 11, Psalm 11. And I'll share three things, anchoring on Psalm 11, but then I'll bring in several other verses just to support and to bring this home. I have chosen this morning into the afternoon to title our sharing, Discovering the Difference the God Factor Makes. Discovering the Difference the God factor makes. Uh, um, and so in Psalm 11, it is a very, it's a very interesting psalm. Also gloomy in a sense because of the historical things that are happening in this psalm. This psalm depicts David to be in great danger. He is in serious danger because um, of a number of things. One, Saul is chasing after him. In Psalm, uh, in First Samuel, First Samuel chapter nineteen, verse one, Saul is chasing after him. If you read the whole of uh, First Samuel chapter nineteen, Saul wants actually to kill David, and David uh, is a besieged man. But secondly, we see that David's house is in shambles. Number one, his son, Absalom, wants to kill him. Uh, if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 15, 2 Samuel chapter 15, Absalom wants to kill his father. And you see turmoil there, right in within the family. Uh, probably resonates with many of us that uh, 
in circumstances and situations where we live in, there are a lot of issues happening within the family. But secondly, in David's family, you see that uh, there is sexual immorality in his family. Amnon wants to have an affair, actually violates his half-sister, Tamar. Uh, violates Tamar, and it then brings a lot of war between the brothers, and David is very depressed because of what's happening here. You then see that David is not at peace. And so when Psalm 11 is written, that forms the broader context of what's happening in the house of David. So the three things that I want to highlight from this Psalm, which I'll beef up with uh, several other verses, including Proverbs 18 verse 10, and uh, the Gospel reading, uh, John chapter 14. Number one, David is told of what he should do by those who are around him. In verse 1, and I want you to look at Psalm verse 1, Psalm chapter 11 verse 1, it says, In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? And so those who are around David, whom we call his counselors, in this context we can call his advisors, are telling him to flee, to run away, because of the little historical context that I've, I've described, that situation in David's personal life and in his family. They tell David to flee for safety to the mountains because of what is happening in his house. Do you know what David's response is? How can you tell me to run away? That's what he says. He says, I take refuge in the Lord. What David is saying here is that he will not abandon his position. He will not run, run away from his role. He will not abdicate duty because the situation is tough and is hard. But on the contrary, he will stay put and seek refuge in God in the midst of the terrible things that are happening around him at this time. This simply teaches us what David affirmatively says here is that it teaches us a number of things. Let me highlight two here. That, number one, we must be very careful about the people that we listen to. Who do we listen to? Because his, his counselors, his advisors, have analyzed the situation and are advising him to flee to the mountain, to flee for safety, to abandon his position, to run away. Do you know, many times the people who talk to us if you don't listen to them with the ears of God and with a heart that is inclined to God, then 50% they tend to mislead us. Ladies, your husband could be going through a situation and your marriage is under threat. 50% of your friends will tell you, you, are, you deserve better in life than that man. Leave him. Go look for another person. Actually, you have enough resources to take care of yourself. And sometimes you realize that people who cheer you on to break your marriage are the people who will be then flirting with your husband once you've left. There are people who will quickly tell you, come on, go file. Uh, these days, there's the language of filing. Go file. Go put up a case for divorce or separation in court. And so before we give up on situations, it's important that we ask ourselves, who is advising me? Who is counseling me? Sometimes we want to take off because we have not personally processed. Sometimes we make mistakes because we have not analyzed those situations and listened to God. But we must recognize that the greatest thing that we must do 
is to listen to what God is saying. Because when God speaks, then he affirms us and he gives us a better and interesting perspective. A perspective that sees beyond the problems. Because actually that is what David uh, is told here. Today we are in a situation where many of us believe that the president is being misadvised. The same way our governors and members of parliament and other corporate leaders, including church leaders, are being misadvised. So who is your counsel? Who stands around you to speak to you? Weigh those situations as a believer in light of what God is revealing to you in scripture and act on the basis of what God tells you. But the second thing we see here is that we must always discern between fear and faith. There is a tension that exists between faith and fear. So fear tells you to run away, but faith tells you to stay on and to look at what God is able to do. I am so happy that this church is choosing to take the journey of faith and mobilize 15 million to complete those two incredible projects. But fear will tell you that it is too much. We finished this church, we need to rest. You know, those words of old, Nafatu Pumzike, we need some lull time to rest. That is the voice of fear. So the tension that exists between faith and fear then can determine whether we go on to succeed or we go on to fail. But let me tell you this morning that faith, when you take away fear from it, then gives you favor. So faith minus fear equals to favor. That is double F. But people who exalt fear then will receive ridicule and will end up failing. So number one is what people tell David. Be very careful with what people tell you. Number two, in verse two, the Bible says, look, other versions say, see the wicked bend their bow and they have filled their arrow with string to shoot in the dark at the upright in the heart. So I want to pick the word see, which is translated in that version, look. So again, David's counselors, those who have told him to run away, are telling him to look at the problems. And what they are telling him is to see the problems, how big and how intimidating they are, and that is why they are asking David to run away. David chooses to do the opposite. David chooses to see God and not to see the problems. When we look at things and problems from a God perspective, then the solutions become clearer and easier to achieve than when we look at things from a negative perspective. And I want to give you an example of how David applied this in his life. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, David faces a huge man called Goliath. And Goliath is inches, I mean, meters tall, huge. And David is a young, tiny boy. He's a war man who is experienced in war, comes and faces uh, David. You know, as David faces Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, he does not see Goliath. David chooses to see God. Do you know what he says in verse 45 and 46? You come to me with a sword and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the God of the armies of Israel. Did you hear that? You come to me with a spear and a sword, but I come to you in the name of the God of the armies of Israel. What does David do therefore? David therefore looks at God magnifies him and allows him to dominate that situation that he is saturated with the vision of God. So that the bigness of Goliath is reduced to a sizable, small, tiny portion, yet God is magnified and dominates and takes over the space that Goliath is, 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 is occupying. That for me as a believer is the God factor. So when you magnify God in situations that look difficult and are potentially worthy of running away from, then God dominates. Then he breaks into those situations and then he scatters the enemy. 
And I don't know, as we sit here as members of St. Paul's and visitors of St. Paul's here and friends of St. Paul's, I don't know what is dominant in your life. I don't know what is intimidating that the enemy has trained your eye to see and to magnify more than God. You know, sometimes we magnify the problems that our children go through. And maybe they are in drugs. And we see drugs to be so difficult and so big that we don't see the possibility of God redeeming and setting free our children. Some of them are in, in rehabs. Some of them have failed jobs and they're not able even to take up a job. And we look at our successful careers and we wonder, what will become of my children? Beloved, this morning, I want to invite us to see the God factor and to discover the difference that the God factor makes when you magnify him and allow him to be big in that situation. I'll give you uh, some two practical steps at the end of my sharing. But even when your marriage is struggling, even when he's turned against you and is pursuing side chicks all over, or even when she's run away from you, or even when business has refused to pick up because of the prevailing economic situation, when consultancy is taking a nosedive, when the situation is bleak and dark and it warrants you quitting and running away. The sermon today is reminding us to open our eyes and see God and zoom him in into those situations. Then God comes and takes over. He dominates. Do you know that is what David did in that case with Goliath? That is why in Psalm 121, he says, I look up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? I look up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. And that is why the singer sang and said, Yesu akiwa enzini, Yesu akiwa enzini mambo yapi. When the Lord is on the throne, and I want to see you there. I want you to see that as we sing with the choir this song in a minute. In verse 4, he says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. So do not look at the problem. Look at the Lord in his holy temple. That's what David says. Look at him in his holy temple. In the mountain. Because Zion is highly exalted and Jerusalem is in the mountain. Look at him in the mountain. Don't look at the problem. See him. Because when the Lord is on the throne, things are already better. When the Lord is on the throne, things are already better. Things are already better. Things are already better. Mbo sawa sawa. Mbo sawa sawa. Yes, akiwa enzini mambo sawa sawa mambo sawa sawa mambo sawa sawa mambo sawa mambo sawa sawa hallelujah mambo sawa sawa yesu yes akiwa enzini mambo sawa sawa mambo sawa sawa Mambo sawa sawa. Amen. So number one, the people show, uh, the people tell David things that he refuses to listen to. So refuse to listen to negative advice. Number two, the people around David see negativity and impossibility, but David sees God and he sees possibilities. Number three, in verse three, the Bible says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the rushes do? When the foundations are shaken, what can the rushes do? And so in this scenario, then number three, David then wonders. He is poised to be king. His family in sh is in shambles. The outgoing king is chasing after his soul. Everything is terrible and working against him. And that is the context in which David asks this question. When the foundations are being destroyed... When the foundations are shaken, what can the rushes do? And you know that resonates with our country today. When the pillars of our democracy 
are being shaken. What can believers like you and I do? When the systems that we put for governance in our country are failing us and institutions that are meant to support us in realizing the dreams that our fathers had for this country, then what can the Russians do? You and I, what can we do? So when David asks that question, he is simply training our eyes back to God again. Because in verse 4, he sees God seated on the throne in his heavenly places. And that really resonates with Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. And there Solomon says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The rushes run to it and they are safe. That the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The rushes run to it and they are safe. In that, in that Proverbs then, what the rushes need to do when the foundations are shaken are two things. Number one, is to discover the premium that is in the name of the God of Israel. To discover the value, to discover the power that is resident in the name of the God of Israel. So, Psalm 18 says, that name of the Lord, number one, it's a strong tower. It's a strong tower. Number two, it's a place of refuge. Meaning, number three, it's a place of safety. So the name of the Lord is a strong tower and it's a place of safety for anyone who is going through a crisis like David did. He recognizes, therefore, that he cannot go to Saul because actually Saul is the king and wants to kill him. Reminds us, even as a people of faith, even as congregants of this wonderful church, that when things turn red, when things go south, what then do we need to do? We need to discover the name of the Lord and the power that is resident in the name of God. And even at such a time as this, our help is, is, is not in the presidency. I'm afraid to say that our help is not in the presidency. Our help is not in parliament because they have failed us time and again. Our help is not in the opposition because they come with selfish interests and they have failed us time and again. Some of them are political cartels looking at opportunities to make money and prosper themselves and their families and their cronies and therefore our help is, is, is not in the opposition. I'm afraid to tell you that our help is, is not in the Gen Z's. As much as they're driving a wonderful agenda that I resonate with 100%, but our help does not rest there. Our help begins in the name of God, which is a strong tower where the rushes can run to and they are safe. Let me tell you, for you to discover that God is our source of help, look at how we voted in 2022. How excited we were with the presidency. Look at Look at the songs we, we, we composed. Look at the passions. Situlisama si uchawi ni maombi. Situlisama ni mteule wa mungu. Situlisama ni kujibiwa kwa maombi. Look at where we are. Our solution is in the God of Israel. Solomon says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. That name is the only name that when we run to, then we can be safe. Let me just tell you how that name uh, looks like uh, practically. Those who recognize that name, that name never, failed them, never fails them. In, 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 back again in Samuel, uh, I mean in Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 13. 1 Chronicles we get the story of David having defeated the Philistines and grabbed the ark from them and is taking the ark back to Jerusalem. And do you know, a guy called Uzzah is guiding the ark. And as they go back in First Chronicles chapter 13, the ark tries to fall off the cart and Uzzah takes his hand to uh, support the ark so that it doesn't fall off. Do you know what happened to Uzzah? God struck him there and then and he died on the spot. Remember, the ark is being taken to Jerusalem, to the palace, to David's palace now. 
when David saw God's anger over Uzzah and his reaction to the ark, David directed that the ark of the covenant be not taken to his palace. Do you know what he's saying? He ordered that it be taken to the house of one of the servants called Obed Edom. So he just directed. You know, when the king directs, you can't question. So you can imagine how Obed Edom is shaking and wondering, I'm the one now who is going to be killed. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter 13 at the end that the ark stayed in the house of Obed Edom for 90 days and the Lord prospered the house of Obed Edom for those 90 days that the ark of the Lord was there. That is the God factor. When you welcome the God factor in your house, then people who thought, people who thought that you will be killed will recognize that contrary, the Lord brings blessings there. Amen? And I want to ask you, mothers here, mothers of sons and mothers of daughters here, who look at your children and you cry every single day. You go to office or work and your heart is so heavy when you look at what your children are going through. Some of them have been swallowed up by the things of this world and they've turned their back on your God and your church. And you feel that life is so meaningless because you've invested so much in church, yet your children have refused to take after it. I want to ask you, mothers of sons, could you discover the difference that the God factor makes? By doing one thing, create a time of prayer. Create a time of calling on the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, over your children. Mention their names every morning. I know you love golf. I know you love to go check on the hardware. I know you love to go for the Naivasha retreats. If you work in government, especially when you want to clean up uh, the budgets. I know that you love to travel to Dubai. Could you create and substitute substantial amount of time for prayer and fasting, petitioning the God of David, the God of Obed Edom, to come into your situation and turn things around? For me, I know that God, that when you call on him, he will do what he did to Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. When he heard that Jesus is passing by, he shouted. Others are quietening him and telling him, come on, keep quiet. You're making noise to the Savior. He's passing. He refused and he shouted and said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He called on the name of the Savior. When you call on the name of the Savior, Jesus was attracted by his attention and pronounced quick healing and his eyes were opened. Mothers of sons, when you call on his name, the Lord will intervene and bring a solution to your situation. Amen? To you fathers, when things are becoming tough and the economy is refusing to get together, I ask you to call on the name of God. Call on that name because when you call on that name, then things will be different. But then lastly, apart from prayer, and I want this to be a character of every believer that we should unashamedly commit to a discipline of prayer. Where they're here, whether individually at home, learn to kneel beside your bed. Learn to create an altar at home. Learn to go for prayer walks. I know we go for walks in Karura. I know we go for, uh, for uh, walks in, um, um, in the golf club. But please learn to create a time for walking as you do prayer walk. By the way, it's a very powerful tool. I exercise that a lot of times. So prayer is a tool for inviting the God factor in situations that warrant you to run away or to be depressed like David was almost. But secondly, and finally, I invite you to obey the Lord. In our second reading in John chapter 14, verse 23, the Bible says, in verse 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. That you obey the Lord. Obey the Lord. Obeying the Lord simply means trusting in every single thing that the Lord says. Not in what politicians say, but what the Lord says. When you obey him, when you take him at his word, then the Lord says he will bring his home, make his home together with you, with Jesus Christ. You know, that is what Deuteronomy chapter 28 was telling us in our first reading. That when you obey him, then he will cause all the blessings of heaven 
to be part of us. He says he will bless the works of our hands. He'll bless the seed of our womb. He'll bless our farms. He'll bless us when we go out and when we come in. So obedience is the second currency alongside prayer that brings in the God factor. And when the God factor comes, it makes a difference. Amen? Let me warn us, even as I come to pray, that obedience to the God factor is critical for our generation and the generation of the Gen Zs today. But I'm afraid that there is a rhetoric that is brewing among the Gen Zs of unmatched hatred to God. Many times I slip into the, the space conversations. I was there on Thursday. I was there the other time. And there are lots of things about let's occupy churches, let's occupy churches. The church has failed us. Pastors have failed us. And God has failed us. I want to correct something. And I want you to correct this for the sake of your children and the generations they belong to. That God has not failed us. Pastors may have failed us. Pastors may have trooped to state house taking envelopes and then uh, went to bed with government. They may have failed us, refused to talk when we needed to correct the king and tell him he's naked. Omolo may have failed as a minister. Professor Njenga may have failed. Your bishop or archbishop may have failed. And that is okay because you're human. But God has not failed. God has not failed and he will not fail. And mothers and fathers, our children are on the, on the brink of turning their backs on God because of this narrative. And I hear them say, we don't want to go to church. We don't want church. We may be raising a generation that is godless because of what's happening now. Encourage them to recognize that God has not failed. A few individuals in that institution, which is sinful, called the church, have failed. But God has not failed. So that we keep our children inside God. Amen? Three things as we finish. One, who cancels you? Who advises you? Do an overhaul of your advisory team. The president seemed to have failed to listen to the advisory of the populace. Please don't be like the president. What do you see when situations are black and red? Please could you open your eyes to see God and zoom him in into that situation. Even in the construction of this church, even in the projects we are undertaking, may we zoom in God. But then thirdly, when the foundations are shaken, may we discover the God factor. By number one, praying. But number two, by living in obedience to this God. Amen? When we live in that obedience, then God will bless us. And I want to encourage you, as we bring more resources, that is part of inviting God into your home and God blessing you more and more. So I pray that the spirit of generosity will stir up our hearts in cell groups, will stir up our hearts in families to give more and more even to the projects that we are undertaking. And people will see the difference. People will notice that Mama Shiko, Sikuizi, ata watoto wake wamebadilika, ata mume wake amebadilika kwa sababu ya kuomba kwake na uaminifu wake kwake Mwenyezi Mungu. People will see. Men, people will notice the difference in your life when you obey and when you commit to the Lord in prayer. I pray that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords who never changes, the I am, the Alpha and the Omega may be with each one of us and enable us to see him clearly as him alone is. I share this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.